Well, good evening and welcome to the A Trip to the Moon podcast. My name is Matt Jones. I am joined by Nigel Adderley, by Rob Pattinson. Hopefully we're going to have Alex Hay on with us soon as well. And we are, of course, reacting to the the sad the uh, news that Mickey Mellon has now departed Prenton Park. He has been sacked this afternoon as Rovers manager. His second stint coming to an end, which I guess... Uh, not many of us wanted to see, but plenty of us possibly foresaw coming. So let's get some reaction to this in a an emergency podcast. We'll start with yourself, Nigel. I mean, this is it's sad news because none of us wanted to see it end this way. The way that Mickey has been with the fans, that the kind of success that he's brought to Prenton Park, obviously two promotions, no manager other than him and Johnny King has been promoted as Tranmere boss since the 60s. But... If you read Twitter and other social media, people will tell you that something had to be done. Yeah, I think it was inevitable, but I think that every Tramia fan, whatever your view about Mickey Mellon or the, the way that the, the season has gone, should thank him because when he came to the club in his first spell, we were heading towards mid-table in the National League and he galvanised us in the short term. And I know that he had problems the second season, but then we got promotion against Boreham Wood and then went straight through towards League One. I think the problems then started, but he's a Tranmere legend. I think that he and Johnny King are up there as our two greatest managers of all time, and that won't change. But I think the second spell just never quite worked. Even last season when things were going well and it looked like we were going to get promotion alongside Forest Green, things fell apart very quickly and it wasn't a huge surprise. And this season, with the way the club have been looking to do things, it just wasn't a Mickey Mellon type scenario. And I always felt it was going to take something extraordinary for it to work. And sadly, it hasn't worked. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely spot on, Nigel. I think um, it, it is a strange emotion, isn't it? Whenever, I mean, I say whenever Mickey leaves the club, because this is, you know, we've had this before in, um, in, in quite a different scenario the last time. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, you can't not reflect on on the successes and what he brought for us all in terms of you know that 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 kind of three year run of going to Wembley every season. You know, the, it just felt like we hadn't had anything like that since the, those playoff runs in the in the early nineties and the, the the kind of real sense of a club a club going somewhere. And I suppose the contrast to to that feeling at the moment, uh, where it almost feels back into that apathy you know a club that's struggling for a, a a purpose a sense of identity um and we'll get into some of the i'm sure we'll get into some of the the key issues and challenges that lie ahead for who comes next but it you know it, it has felt like this has been something that we're we're kind of inevitably moving towards now for 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 several weeks you know and and um it, it hasn't really felt this season since the since the close season really since the recruitment that the fit between what Mickey would want to be doing with the club and where the club was looking to go and 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 when how it wants to approach things it, it hasn't really felt like that's that's going to work that, that there's a, enough of a synergy between uh, what a manager can do and what a club wants to do and I think Mickey hasn't really shown uh, either a willingness or an ability to adapt to what the club seems to want to be doing and uh, I think we've got to a point where it, it, it's the best for everyone and it's a, a really sad thing to see. But but I really don't think the club was at a point where it, it had an, a, any options at this stage. I think that the, the decision had to be made and it's it's come at the right time. Um, but I, I don't wish, you know, I, 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 I would love to have seen it work out differently, but but it doesn't affect what what Mickey, you know, means to us all or, or what I think of Mickey. Um as a, a you know, he, he re, re, remains and will always remain a Tramia legend for us, and and I think we just wish him well. Hopefully, we we move on and, and the club can find can find what it desperately needs, which is a a, a way forward that we can get the fans back involved and and we feel like we're going somewhere because it's been very very stale now, hasn't it, for a while? So, yeah, it's a, it's a sad day, but it also I, I think we all felt an inevitable day today. Alex Hay joins us as well. Al, your former. Teammate, your former cat, obviously someone you know incredibly well. Um, a sad day. Yeah, I think it is sad, and I think just reading things very quickly, it, it, it does seem everyone feels sad that it's it's gone like this and it's happened. Um, it's a hard one. I think when any manager loses a job, it, 
it is sadness because it shows something's not working, something's not gone right, and um, someone's lost a job. And I think everyone's really respectful of what Mickey's done. But as as Rob and Nigel have both said, I think something had to happen, uh, one way or another. Something had to happen uh, because it seemed like the club was going in the wrong direction. Every everything seemed to be getting a bit poisonous again, and the atmosphere inside Prenton Park was was turning. And turn in the wrong way, so I think something had to be done. And um, it's just it, it's sad, really, because of everything that Mickey's done and um, for us over over the previous sort of stint that he had. Um, and the sort of when he first come back, I think the positivity that everyone was excited again and where it could go, and it just hasn't worked out like that. But I think, as I stated before, I think the whole club's got to look at itself and say, what can we do next as a club? Where do we go and what's the plan? And how are we gonna get there? And whoever comes in, I think this this next manager is a massive, massive job on the hands um, for everything to knit together. However, the, the the chairman chairwoman want us to be in the future. It all has to knit together, and everyone's got to be on the same page. And for me, for the last few months, it doesn't seem like everyone's been on the same page. So, as I say, I'm disappointed for Mickey personally on a personal note because I think I wanted them to do so well because I know how much he cares. Um, but on on the club as a whole, I think something had to be done. I don't think you'll find many people who disagree that, that that not everyone has been on the same page, and I think that's been the biggest concern over the last few uh, few weeks and months. We'll talk about where next uh, later on because we've got a bit of time to to have a look at how things go. But in terms of Mickey, how does this affect his legacy, Nigel, of, of what he leaves behind at Tranmere? I think that it's part of it, and and I think that will always be something you can't ignore. Uh, I think that obviously two spells as a player as well when he was alongside Alex in his first spell as well, and you know he he was part of a decent team at times, and he was a decent player, and he and he went off to Burnley and had success uh, during those spells, and then you, you look at him as a manager, he has been a very good manager. You, you look at the number of promotions he has won. And and you look at the lower divisions across the board, and I think it puts him probably in the top 10 from the last uh, 10 or 15 years because he was a success at Fleetwood, he was a success at Shrewsbury, and of course he had a success at Tranmere. I think personally, he should have stayed with us after the demotion. And he rather than going to, to Dundee United, he should have had a crack at trying to get us back up in that first season I, because I always think there was unfinished business there and for him to leave uh, and Michael Jackson of course got appointed and then Keith Hill came in it, I, I felt that was a job that he didn't finish by, by leaving us in those circumstances and when he came back you always say never go back of course Johnny King did and, and had um, the golden era in the club's history but it's just never quite worked I think last season he, he tried to do it the Mickey Mellon way with experienced players playing a certain style of play. And I think a number of fans weren't happy. They looked at how Forest Green and Exeter were playing football at the top of the table compared to what we were doing. And, and there was undoubtedly a difference there. And I think that one of the problems has been that so, too many people at the club, and it comes right from the top, uh, have been too reactive. And I think what's happened this season has been a reaction to maybe the way the fans felt about last season. And, and you looked at what style of football got success last season in League Two. And, and, and we've tried to go down that road, but we're doing it with a manager that isn't really suited to that. I mean, if you look at, say, polar opposites in League Two, you've got maybe got Steve Evans at one end and you've got Rob Edwards and Matt Taylor who got promotion last season at the other. I would say, taking personality out of it, Mickey Mellon is closer to maybe Steve Evans in terms of football than he is to Rob Edwards. But we've tried to go down the Rob Edwards route, if you want to call it that, this season. And it just wasn't going to work. And I think that what's happened this season shouldn't really be, shouldn't tarnish his overall legacy because he has been a great Tranmere manager, but it's not been great this season. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd pick up on that. And there's a few points in that that I think are, are really important as well, Nigel. I, I, I dip into as well. I think... Not only was it probably in hindsight for Mickey the wrong decision to leave us when he did for Dundee, but also the fact that that meant that the Michael Jackson Mickey Mellon partnership was broken up, and I think that's been a big part of this as well. Because actually, we we've 
you know, we've bemoaned a lot this season about tactical inflexibility and, you know, sort of trying the same thing over and over and, and things feeling very stale. And I think you can't underestimate the the impact that Jackson had in terms of the detail on the training ground, the coaching, the the work with the players. Now, that isn't to um, criticise the guys who are there now, because I know, you know, we, I've got a lot of time for, for, for Parkinson and, and Dawes. I think they've contributed a lot, but I do think Michael Jackson's a very, very good training ground coach uh, and and you know anyone you hear talking about him talks about the work he puts in and then you know how much he does behind the scenes and I think if you look back to that last season in League One when we'd started to turn things around a lot of that period was around really fluid changes of system trying to find a way that works we tried three up front we had three at the back at times we were playing a four, three four three at one stage a four two three one a four four two we moved it around and we looked like we were really trying to find a system that worked for a game and the irony is that a lot of what Vicky would say you know, every press conference this season was you have to answer the questions the game asks. And yet every, it seemingly, whatever the questions the game was asking, we were turning up doing exactly the same thing. Um, whereas actually in that period where we looked like a side that was was actually playing exciting football, turning things around, winning away games, scoring two or three goals. And yes, there's, you know, there's there's different players and we, we you know, we recruited very well into that run and, and Mickey would probably argue that he's not been given the hand to play that sort of football this season. But I do think that, part, you know, managerial partnerships with assistants are, are really important things and, and you find some managers struggle without certain, you know, uh, p- people who can help carry out their wishes on the training ground and I think that's played into it as well this season. Um, but it, it definitely, you know, it definitely is absolutely the case that, Mickey's genu- you know, general style of football, his general belief in football is very much around you win your physical battles, you win your right to play football, you keep the ball, you keep it tight, you try and pride your clean sheets and you try and nick a goal. I mean, that has generally been his way of playing football. And, and we saw at the start of the season him coming out, giving an interview saying, well, you all ask for goals, that's what you're going to get. You're not going to get clean sheets, you're going to see risky football, we're going to concede lots. We start the season playing that sort of 3-5-2 system and in a horror show first game of the season, we didn't seem to really recover from that. And eventually the 3-5-2 is abandoned. James Vaughan leaves. It feels like perhaps Mickey's won a bit of a battle behind the scenes to say, well, you know, you're going to let me have to play my way of football if we're going to turn this around. We, we end up in the 4-4-2 system. And it just feels at that point, it's almost like the autopilot was set on and and, and things never quite gelled and never seemed to work. So there's been a lot of go- things going on this season. Going back to your earlier point, Nigel, I would really say there's a there's a. It's not just about having to. I think it might be new as well, Alex. It's not just about having to, you know, really get things right going forward. I think the communication with the fans, we've you know, we've got to, they've got to be the, the you know, the, the ownership of this club. I think have absolutely got our best interests at heart and love the club, but I think there is something to be said about how you communicate, how you set your path, how you bring people along with you, and I think that you know there's a lot of work that needs to be done to really be, you know, give us some clarity really about what they see as the direction, you know, what, where maybe things have changed from the initial plans, given the the effects of COVID. We have had the, uh, you know, a few of the Facebook lives. I know that, but I, I do think really, you know, th- th- there needs to be a lot more of a, of a, a, of a, of a, of a, some kind of communication in place to really set out what our vision is, what our plan is. Are we going to bring a director of football into to, to replace James Bourne? Are we going to recruit someone who wants to play a certain way of football that will support youth development? Because on the positive side, we've got actually the core of some very good players at, at this club. I mean, it needs some additions, but you need to find a way to play to get the most out of them. And I think we do need more leaders in there, but I know we'll come on to some of the, the looking forward stuff. Overall, though, I, th- I think, you know, Mickey's win percentage... This time around, I've just been looking, it was 40.21%. The first time around, it was 46.23%. So it's actually not massively different. You know, he hasn't had a horror show over time with us this second spell at all. But I just think we could all see that, you know, if things have gone stale and time run out. But but it doesn't overall tarnish for me what Mickey brought to us as a, as a player and a manager. And I think this exit hasn't, you know, it doesn't seem to have been on it particularly, you know, there hasn't been a complete, you know, melt Antonio Conte type meltdown here to, to end this spell or anything. Um, you know, he, he looked quite forlorn and, and uh, you know, like there were a few things he, he didn't really want to have to say yesterday. Uh, more about the players, I think, and maybe we can come on to that a little bit, maybe letting him down on the pitch. But, uh, you know, I, I don't think fan, the majority of fans, I don't think will, will um, 
really have a bad word to say about Mickey. I think we all just felt a change had to be made. And sometimes, you know, you, you love someone, but they, they you know, they, it, it just breaks down and stops working. And I think that's where we got to with Mickey, unfortunately. So. Not even a Keith Hill style exit interview either. <laughs> um, we've got a comment there from Des who says, Jacko was the Peter Taylor to Mellon's Clough. And I want to get Alex's opinion on this because obviously you played with Mike Jackson and with Mickey Mellon. And we had... Um, we had Gareth Roberts pick a best 11 about a month ago, maybe. And he was talking about how, and, and you'll be very familiar with this era, Ray Mathias and Dave Kelly just dovetailed perfectly together. And when Dave Kelly came into the dressing room, it just made a massive, massive difference. And it gave everyone a lift. And you went on that 15-game unbeaten run, missed out on the playoffs with a club record tally of 80 points, but basically only missed out because of the 3-3 draw against Cardiff. Kelly then leaves and goes to Sheffield United and by mid-September, Ray Mathias has been sacked and, and Gareth basically said taking Kelly out of the dressing room again was the big difference and it was what changed with Ray. And I, I mean, you weren't on the inside this time around, but you can see why Mickey might have missed Jacko and, and Jacko might have missed Mickey as well to a degree. Uh, not that I'm sure Mike is... I was at a Burnley game a few weeks ago and he was sitting on the Burnley bench next to Vincent Company, so I'm sure he's quite happy with how he's doing at the moment. Um, but it, it was clear to... It looks pretty clear that they missed each other. I remember when Jacko uh, came in, I said to Mickey, what's he bring? And he basically said he brings a massive manual of coaching sessions that he can put on and, and you know, you'll be able to talk more about managerial partnerships from that sense. Yeah, it's a massive thing. And I think that the assistant manager or assistant, whatever it may be, can can have such a massive impact. Um, they're linked to the manager a lot of the time. Um, and sometimes different managers might not be great at the at the sort of man management type thing, but that's where the assistant will come in and they'll put their arm around you. Ned, for me personally, was unbelievable. Um, he just built me up um, and knew exactly about sort of they loved the club, obviously. He had us playing the way he wanted us to play, but it was sort of Ned who was giving me the impetus to go on and play. And if I ever had an issue or I was feeling down, it was him I'd go through before I went to speak to the to the gaffer. Um, and he was the one that had lifted up and build you up. And that can have the impact on different players. Um, going through, I think Richard Hill and Brian Little worked really well together as well. They were another partnership. But I think when Ned left, I think he banged, he was bringing the majority of the players up and he banged me and I was absolutely devastated because for me personally, I knew that was going to be a massive thing. Um, and the people who came in after Ned left just did, weren't the same and it didn't it didn't knit together. It, it, it wasn't the same club as it, as it felt it was. And the, and the squad and the, the, the team sort of ethos just wasn't the same. So it can have a massive influence, both negative and positively, but... Looking from the outside in, it just didn't seem Mickey was himself over the past few months. He didn't seem himself. His body language wasn't the same. And I'm not going to say he'd lost his fight, but he looked like he'd lost something. Um, and that's not what you want to see. And maybe Jacko had, a, had an influence on that. And there were very, really good things about Parky and what he's doing. But again, it's you'd, you'd have your partnerships and, and Mickey and, and Mike Jackson obviously work really well together. And, and they sort of came as a team. Um, and that's what they'd have worked on and it, it can be such a massive thing so it does have an impact um, and that's why I think sometimes when a manager comes they bring their staff with them because they know how they work they trust each other they know what the other one's going to bring and that sometimes happens and with us in the case it hasn't been like that it's just been a manager without their staff and I think that can have an influence on, on the way things go as well Certainly can. And we know now that Parkinson and Dawes or Dawes and Parkinson are going to take the team going uh, forward and we will see what happens uh, from that point of view. Uh, it is a fascinating time. It, it's another huge appointment. I, I know we've said many times this is a, a, a massive cornerstone in Tranmere's history, but it really is, isn't it, Nigel? Because at the moment, Tranmere are treading water in League Two or dare I say it, going a little bit backwards in League Two. If they get this appointment wrong, they're going to be fighting at the basement of League Two, which is absolutely not where anyone wants to be. But if they get it right, they could be getting back towards the, the third tier. So th this is a huge, huge moment. And we've actually seen it. It's around this time last year that Leighton Orient and Stephen has changed their manager. And look what's happened there. Yeah, and I think it's been such a poor league that it, it won't take too much to get things right. But at the same time, if we don't make the right appointment, we could find ourselves in trouble at the wrong end of the table. You look how much money Crawley have spent under their new ownership this season and look where they are. They may just survive in the end, 
but having outlaid so much money, it's been a very disappointing season. But Orient, having made the change and, and brought in Richie Wellens when they were struggling, are, are now going to win the championship by an absolute mile. So it, it, it could go one of two ways. And, and that's why it's always a big appointment. But I think now it particularly is. But we need to find a manager who can fit in with the ethos that the club want to use at the moment. And if we continue saying it's about bringing in young players, develop, developing them and making money by selling them on, we've got to find somebody who can fit in within that. But it's a huge job because you're, you're not just trying to make money for the club, but you're also trying to get results on the field. And, and we know that we do have a very demanding fan base and that can be a massive plus when things are going well but it can also be a negative when things aren't going so well. And that's not criticising anybody, but the, the fact is, Tramia fans, when things aren't going too well, let people know. And I think that that passion has often driven the club in, in a positive sense over the last 20 years as well. So it's somebody who needs to try and deal with that. Do you go for somebody who, who knows the club? Maybe someone from, from Alex's generation? Or do you get a complete outsider in, but somebody who could work within the parameters and is comfortable in working in, within the parameters that we're trying to set now. It's it, it's a very difficult one, and I don't envy Mark Palios in, in making that decision. The route that they go down now, then, you've just talked about the plan, and I, th I think this has been the big issue this season, is that Mickey Mellon has been extraordinarily successful in one particular way of building the spine of a team with experienced, solid professionals who know what it means and know what it takes to win football matches. If we look at the Tranmere team that he had that went up, Norwood, Norburn was a little bit younger, I suppose, but Harris was in there, McNulty, Davis. That's the spine of a team, plus whoever else he had. And he didn't sign any there. of those. Well, he, he signed Norburn, didn't he? Um, but he didn't, he didn't sign those other three, certainly. But he... It, he had Davis and McNulty at Fleetwood. He had the spine of a team, older players who, who knew what it takes. This year, it's been a strategy to go down the younger route with players who, let's be honest, only one of them has actually really featured greatly in the first team. And that was Bristow. Hockenhall's gone out on loan. Hughes, I know, is back now. But McAleer's gone out on loan as well. That The signings that came in haven't really had that big an impact on the team. And that's because he is better at developing players at maybe the 24, 25, 26 age bracket plus so, as Nigel correctly says, Rob, the manager who comes in has got to be, if that's the plan that they definitely want to go down, they've got to have someone who's comfortable with that route. Otherwise, it's just going to be another waste. Yeah, and I think um, and I think that's got to be how um, Mark and Nick will go into their, into their recruitment strategy and their interviews. Um, it, you know, it, there has to be those conversations about, you know, I'd like to see candidates actually coming in with a real kind of dossier about the players we've got, the development players we've got, and saying this is, you know, what I can see us doing with these players. Because, you know, the, there are players at the club, you know, we've still got John Nolan here as far as, I, as, far as I'm aware. We haven't seen him since probably January. Um, but that, that kind of calibre of, of player, I mean, he, to me, is kind of the... The, the example of where the, the, the mishmash of where we're at is, really, because, you know, I don't think his signing is reflective of where the club wanted to go. I think it was an attempt by Mickey to bring someone with a bit more experience in there. But, you know, we look at the signings who were brought in in January and, and it's, you know, I, I will say Regan Hendry aside, it's, 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 not been, it's not been what we wanted, has it? We, we've not got what we wanted from those players. And, I think ultimately those those January signings is probably what's ended up costing Mickey because there are obviously players he wanted to bring in. He talked about having Saunders on his list for a long time, but they've really not come in and made any impact at all. You know, I, I would like to see a manager come in who who looks at some of the players and thinks, you know, Sam Taylor. There's a he's looked quite exciting to me, and when I saw him in preseason, you know, you obviously can't, you know, guarantee that these players are going to turn turn into, you know, the, the sort of players we want. But you want a manager who's comfortable trying to get the best out of them and actually playing a style of football that maybe is going to present chances and opportunities. And, 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 and you know, you could build a core of players of what we have here, I think, with experience and, 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 and should be able to lead us forward, augmented by some of these young players who aren't really getting enough of a look in yet who've either been sent out on loan or aren't really trusted. Um... And, and and potentially do something quite exciting, especially if you could bring somebody in. I mean, what we I think we all, what we want to see now is not for the club to stay with Dawes and Parkinson until 
you know, July and then make that recruitment. You'd like to see maybe two or three weeks now of, of going through and finding the right person and then bringing them in. You know, the, the, the benefit we have is we aren't really in a relegation fight right now. OK, we can pretty much put the season aside. We're not going up. We're not going down. So actually, we can get that person in and give them a couple of months or a couple of weeks at least of working with the squad we have now to know when they go into the summer. OK, where do I need to work? Where do I need to recruit? Who have I got who maybe isn't getting much of a looking, but we can bring through in the summer? That is a positive of, of making this decision now. And I think that's that's what we needed to see. And I'm glad we saw it happen now, because if we'd have waited till the summer, you know, Mickey's contract runs out, we bring someone in, you, you, you're starting behind the curve again. So you have got that opportunity now to get somebody and give them the time to assess the squad and then get that recruitment, get those conversations about recruitment in place. We know it, you know, it's a, it's a kind of six month to, to, to 12 month period of recruitment before you get to a window anyway, usually. So we've got that chance. You know, like I say, we've, we've got the likes of Sam Taylor, Ryan Stratulis. Um, you, you know, we've got younger players, Ben Hockenhall. I, I really like the look of Reese Taylor. I don't think we've, we've, we've really used him right. Although I will say, obviously, he's not been set in the world to light at Chester, but that doesn't necessarily mean anything. Charlie Jolly to come back in. I think there's more to come from him, even though he's been pretty inconsistent when he has been around. Um, so I, I think there was, you know, there are players there. I, I, I actually think there's there's promise in, uh, you know, in some of the other, in some of the, in some of the centre backs as well. You know, but we have got the likes of Jordan Turnbull and and Tom Davis and Kane Hemmings, um, Kieran Morris. I think Chris Merry's a, an old head on 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 relatively young shoulders. I think we've got you know some good, experienced players who should be showing more leadership qualities than than they have so far. And I think they need to to step up and show that when we get a new manager in. But we absolutely need someone who can look to play a more progressive style of football. I think the, the key challenge we've all had with Mickey in this spell has been that just for two years now, we've just not created enough chances. We've not scored enough goals. We've not done enough exciting things on the pitch. And it's been quite a sloggy style of football, which doesn't really suit trying to develop and bring young players through. So, yeah, I think we need to really embrace that. And I think there is, you get the right man in and there's a lot, there's a lot to work with. This isn't a squad where you have to throw it all out, rip it all up and start again from scratch. It's a squad that needs some surgery. It's a squad that needs some reappraisal and some tactical work and some changes of patterns of play. But I think getting the right people around came Hemmings. He could turn into a very, very good striker for us. You know, I, I, I don't think he's been used right. I don't think he's had enough to feed off. But I think he's a very, very, very good League Two striker, potentially, you know, lower end League One striker. And I think we've got some very, very good defenders there. We've got some creative midfielders, but, but we need someone who can tie all of this up together and make um, and turn us into a more attacking, progressive side. And we need to see some, you know, going out in away games, wanting to win games of football. How many times have we seen in the last two seasons, you know, turning up at sides who've, who've been on a five or six game losing spell, haven't scored in four games, and yet we end up being the team who, who upsets the apple cart there and they're, and they're back on back on form again. So, yeah, I think I think we, we've got a lot to do, but I think we're at a time now where we can actually, we can if we get that recruitment right, and it's obviously very, very difficult, and we've not maybe always seen the best recruit, recruits come through the door under the Palace regime, but, you know, we'll get on to who's out there. But I think I think there is that opportunity now to, to, to really make that decision and, and then start working with that squad quite soon. Alex, the, what you've seen, well, uh, you, you were going to react there, so I'll let you react first, and then I've got a question for you. <laughs> you know, I think I think on a recruitment front, I think that comes down to who the manager is going to be because you've got to be true to style. There's got to be a plan to it. You can't just recruit players and hope they they or oh, they'll work out because he's a good player. But he might play well in a certain system. So I think again, it's down to the what the manager wants or what the the powers that be want for the club and the way we want to play. And then they go and recruit the right manager to do that. And then he'll then go and be, recruit the players to play that system. Because not every player suits certain systems. And it just feels like and looks like a little bit we're signing players because, oh, they look all right, they look all right. But they don't actually fit into the way we're trying to play or the way Mickey wanted us to play and things like that. So I think the whole the whole idea of it, it's if you get one thing right, that'll sort of start leading to other things going right. And the, the pinpoint the manager is the manager and how we want to play. And then... If they want to play direct football, then so be it. We recruit the best players to play that way to get us up. And I think everyone will accept that if that's the way we're going to play. If 
that's what we're told that's going to be the way it's going to be and that's what we expect but when we're expecting or the people are coming out with comments like we're going to play with the handbrake off and we're, we're going to total attack and things like that and it doesn't happen that's where people start moaning and looking at it in a, in a really negative way so i think like you said earlier bob about this sort of the communication that's where it means if, if if it means no statement then don't make a statement let's just work with it and then we'll see where it is but i think if you're going to make a statement, you've got to make it happen because if it doesn't happen, that's where the problems will start. So what I wanted to ask you as well, Al, is, you know, you've, you've done a lot of scouting. You've done a lot of work for several clubs since, obviously, you've hung up your boots as such. How realistic is this this way of uh, trying to build a club and then sell players and move forward that way? Or And, and if, if that is a going to be successful do we have to wait two or three years before we see the fruits of it because it, it didn't take forest green one year to go up did it they, they built for two three years after coming into the football league and maybe Tranmere fans won't have that patience rightly or wrongly because they're not a club who've come up through the non-leagues they're a club who are down at league two having spent the majority of the last three decades at a higher level yeah, I, th I think it's the patience of everything. And I think, again, that's where the communication is going to be important. Because if people buy into that patience um, and sort of buy into what we want to do long term, then they'll back it. But I think it's whether <laughs> it's the communication and it's hard. I think the recruitment side of it and things like if that's the way we're going to do that, it's got to be a plan, but it's got to be a plan over years. And like you say, it's not going to happen straight away. And not every player we bring in, if that's the case, or every young player is going to work out because it, it, it doesn't work like that. Some of the lads you get on loan from Premier League clubs just don't work out for whatever reason. They're not used to this style of football. They're not used to what it's like to, to be kicked really at League Two. And technically, they might be amazing, but put them on a League Two football, football field, it's totally different. So it, it's a hard one, but I think the recruitment has got to be a plan. And you've got to stick to the plan and it, it, it might take a long time. It might take a couple of years to you start get that plan in place. But there should be a list of players and positions of, of where you're looking. That's what, when I was there, and I was only there for a short time, that's what we're trying to do to build a sort of database of players to fit in a system that we wanted to play. And you'd have target one, target two, target three, and you'd have your loan targets and who will fit into our style of play. And if you're looking at a player and I really like him, and the manager says, great player, but he wouldn't be able to play for us because he wouldn't play in our system, then so be it. And that's the way it's got to be done. But it's got to come from the way we want to play. And I think the structure of it will start building down. But again, I think it boils down to communication in the end, especially with the fans, because if they buy into what we're doing long term as a plan, whether it's a three-year plan, this is where we want to be in three years, then I think that'll make everything easier. Let's have a look at some of the messages uh, that are coming through because there are plenty of them. Uh, Adam Miller says, our recruitment feels a bit scattergun. Uh, there's a message from Dave Hughes as well. The recruitment playing system and expectations seems to be at odds with each other. I don't see how you develop young players in less than two years uh, and then get promotion and sell them for loads. Uh, John Lear, does anyone on this podcast actually believe there is a plan? Are we likely to have a replacement for Mickey lined up? Uh, Mark Palios talks about planning for the summer, but has anyone got any faith that that's likely to happen? Well, the plan has obviously changed over over the last 24 hours. Uh, and I suspect this is not a decision that Mark Palios has taken lightly, absolutely won't have taken lightly to get rid of Mickey because they, they have worked so closely and so well together in the future. So th th there is obviously not going to be an immediate person to come in. And these things don't happen overnight at this level. They might do up at the Premier League level where managers are touting their name about for quite some time. But th there is going to be, you would imagine, a, a little bit of a layover, if not until the end of the season, for a new boss to come in. So uh, I don't know who's got any names that they might think or any ideas of the kind of ballpark that Tranmere should be looking in. But feel free to fire away think, if anyone does. I think, Matt, I think it's hard to throw names in because we don't, we don't know what they're getting given. And I think it's great to say, oh, this name or that name, and I've heard people throw the Cowley mm -hmm. brothers around and things like that. But we don't know what the offer on the table is. We don't know whether they they might look at it and say, no, not a chance, because I've not got a chance in hell to develop a team the way that is. So I know we'll never know that, but it depends what ponds we're fishing in. It depends what what level we're looking at. And long term, is are they going to look for 
a young manager or a young coach that is doing well at an academy or something like that and, and go down that route and say, this is what we want to do. We want to build this coach up over time um, and go from there. That could be one way of doing it. But again, it's hard until we know who's going to be interested in the job. Trammy is a great club. It looks amazing, fantastic, um, great facilities. We've been in the championship a long, long time ago now. Um, we've not long come out of League One, but I think it's what we're selling and what we're, we're offering that manager and what they can do. And I think that's going to be the hardest part. I think the one positive at the moment is, like we've said previously, we're not going to go down, we're not going to go up. So this gives the chairman and chairwoman time to be crewed correctly. But I'd like it to be done or announced a few weeks at least before the end of the season because that gives them time to, to start looking and hopefully speaking to players and agents, because this needs to be done before the season ends to make them aware that we are interested and then we can get business done sorted. But there's, there's a lot of questions to be answered before then. I mean, people have been saying that we need a director of football. We had a director of football this season who seemed to do most of the recruiting during the summer. And then, of course, he left. And uh, I think the director of football model only really works if, A, they're on the same page as the manager and B, they bring in the sort of players that are going to fit to the way the manager wants to play. And I think that if you're going to bring in a director of football, they and the manager almost need to come as a, come in as a team as much as Jackson and Mellon were a team when they came in from Shrewsbury to, to take over and they were a very successful double act. So, I mean, Alex is absolutely right. We, we don't know what the club what well we know what the club wants sort of generally but we don't know how big the budget is now we we don't know how many players they want to keep from this squad i mean i think it's pointless drawing up a retained list and then appointing a new manager because we need someone in i think ideally by the middle of april so they can just take a look they can just maybe have a hands off look at even if it's not made public just have somebody there in the background who was looking and saying, well, I like him. He's not good enough. He would work if we tried to get maybe him in. There's, there's, there's got to be options. And looking at the, the comments on, on the side of the screen tonight, so many people are all saying the same thing. And I think we all want the same thing, that this project could work, but it, it's got to have the right sort of personnel within it. And do we go for a young manager? We tried that with the other Rob Edwards um, back in 2014 and of course it, it didn't work because he didn't have the players to make that plan work so I think people would look at that and say maybe we need somebody e experienced but it's it's such a difficult balancing act I mean if you're going to ask me now I would say John Coleman at Accrington because I think he's done brilliantly there now he may not want to come to Tranmere of course Accrington wouldn't want to lose him but if they go down this season then it's it's potentially he could be looking at a new challenge. But he is somebody who does brilliantly on a small budget. He gets young players from elsewhere, other people's cast-offs, and makes them into decent League One players. And to, to have had Accrington competing where they've been for so many years goes under the radar, but he's been superb. He knows the area as well. And I think for a Tramia manager, as Alex will know, that's something which, which could be important. It's massive, and and to be to be fair, yeah, it's a name that's that's come up before. But I think, as you say, he's got he, he goes into non-league very well. He brings players in, he gives them a go, um, and he progresses them. And this is another area which I think is desperate for. And again, it's not everyone's going to work. But if, if we're looking on a small budget, we need to be looking at non-league and seeing what we can get out of there. And some of these players, I know we got Nevit, which was great, and, and we've done it. But he's not the only one. There's players out there. You've just got to get the sort of <laughs> recruitment's a funny thing but you've got to put money into it as well you've got to be willing to put money into it to get the right scouts at the right games and get them all over the country and I think this is another thing that, that needs to be looked at in the long term is if we're going to do it let's do it right and let's get the, the, the sort of national scouts in place because I think when I was there for the short time they weren't in place and I know it was something that we were looking to do and, and things like that and hopefully it, that, that's the case now I'm, I'm not aware of what's going on now but I think that's something that needed to be done. You've got to get people at games constantly and you've got to put money into it to get the right people doing it, people you trust, whoever the manager is, whoever the manager trusts, get those people looking at the players they want to see. And I think that's where it'll start being a domino effect, but nothing's done in a day.
There's a message from Ian here that says, has Agent Alex been on the phone to DC this afternoon? DC obviously being Dave Chalner. And I think that's the sad thing for me is that they've probably missed the boat now with Dave Chalner. Dave Chalner has been extremely interested in the Tranmere job in the past. And there's probably three or four occasions when they could have gone from in the past. But there's no way they're going to prize him away from Stockport, given the money I suspect he's on and the money that Tranmere are going to be able to pay or the compensation that would be required to prize him away from Stockport. And for me, Rob, that's a sad thing because he's someone I would have loved to have seen at Tranmere one day. Yeah, we spoke about it before, haven't we, Matt? Just like it does feel like the the chance is probably gone. And and, and there have definitely been occasions where we, we could have got him. I think um, last time Mickey left, he was he was favourite for quite a bit. Um. And he, and he does, you know, he does have a lot of the attributes. I mean, you know, we, we do quite like someone who knows the club as well as someone who knows the area. Um, up and coming manager who, who's had a record of promotions. You tick, you tick on those lists of, you know, what, what traditionally Tramir always looked for in a manager. And I think, um, and someone who really wants to be here as well. And I think he, he, he did, he did, he did get all of that. And it would have, it would have probably been a really good uh, appointment for us to make. I'd, Unless things sh- shift over the next few years, I- I'm struggling to see when we'd get Dave in. Uh, just to add to what both Nigel and Alex were saying as well, I think the um, that whole thing about the, the recruitment strategy, understanding the area, putting the things in place. One of the things we've talked about in recent years or, or has been talked about is the links with the likes of Liverpool and Everton and trying to trying to see for them to see us as a, a way of bringing some of their youngsters through. And we've, we've had limited success with that in one or two areas. We had obviously Warrington last season and... Um, and Glatzel as well from Liverpool but that is another thing that hasn't really stretched again into this season I know we, we did try to bring Glatzel back in and, and, and sadly that that you know very quickly fell apart but you know is part of that that those clubs have looked at the way we're playing football and thought it's not really how we want our players to be you know they're not going to get much development from, from going and playing in those kind of systems they need to be playing in a you know with a freedom that, that will help them to develop rather than you know maybe stifling some of their um, some of their development. So, yeah, I, and to, to Nigel's point, actually, around the director of football model, I think when, when Vaughan was appointed, there was that kind of um, statement from from, from Mark uh, around what we wanted to have was a, someone who would be in place where, where managers would change. But we'd have a consistency of model because we'd have a director of football who would kind of be there behind the scenes, no matter who the manager was. And obviously we'd recruit the idea would, I suppose, be that we recruit a manager to fit in, as you were saying, into the system that's being set up behind the scenes, led effectively by a director of football who's looking at that whole model. And ironically, he'd gone before the <laughs> within, within a season. And, you know, so talk about not outlasting, uh, you know, managers. He, he didn't even make it through one. So, um, he, absolutely, I, I think either you bring them in as a, as, a, as a partnership or you have a director of football in first and you have them buying into it, and then you recruit managers to fit that director of football. But, you know, who are you going to get who's going to want to be here for five to ten years as director of football? That's another thing, isn't it? Unless you're bringing in, you know, someone someone young and developing, someone like James Vaughan, obviously, you know, no no blame to him, but he he used us as a kind of stepping stone for, for his career, and, and fair play, you can't say no to, uh, to his boyhood club come knocking to, to come and work with them on their, on their, on their loan systems. But... There's a, there's a lot you've got to get behind the scenes. It isn't as simple as just bringing in a manager and hoping that everything uh, all fits into place. We're going to see a lot of names thrown around. Uh, Adam Miller here has said Pete Wilde, anyone? He's at Barrow at the moment. Um, I've seen the Cowleys named, as you've mentioned, Nigel. I'm sure Paul Cook's name will come up. I'm sure Nigel Adkins' name will come up. But, I mean, all of these, apart from maybe Paul Cook, given he's at, still at Chesterfield, all of these names are unrealistic now, aren't they? Nigel Adkins, unless... Mark Palace can really sweet talk him, isn't going to drop down to League Two. The Cowleys definitely are above a, a League Two level. Yeah, I mean, Clint Hill, somebody who, of course, knows the club. And I think, you know, he's somebody who I th- would like to have been involved, I think, maybe in recent years. How much experience does he have? Well, he's been working with other managers, so he'll have taken experience from that. But if we have a, if we have a figurehead, like him, then maybe you get the coaching staff and you get the recruiting staff around him to make it work. Because I, I look at someone like Ryan Watson, who we brought in last season. I thought he was a really good player, played well in, in League One. But we sign him and we play a system that he doesn't fit into. So, of course, he goes to Salford and he's having a good time as a goal-scoring midfielder. And I thought 
he was the missing link for us potentially last season, but not in the way that we wanted to play. And I was, I was at Liverpool uh, covering a game last season and I was talking to someone from their staff and they said, you're a Tramia fan. Why is Paul Glatzel playing on the wing? And I was like, well, you and me both, because they wanted him to be a centre forward and we played him on the wing. It's, and we briefly moved him to centre forward alongside Hemmings. He looked great and then he gets injured. And I think the big plan this season might have been Hemmings and Glatzel. And of course, that lasted literally seven minutes. So I'm not sure that when we sign players, we actually have an idea of where they want to play. Maybe we, certainly the conversation we've got to have, as, as Alex is absolutely spot on, we, we've got to have a conversation with the manager and say, we could sign him, but where exactly do you see him playing? Because if we don't have that conversation, then potentially it's a complete waste of time. And it, and it has been for a number of high-profile high players in recent years. And it's a waste of time, waste of budget, and it just gets everybody's backs up, not just at Tranmere, but also other clubs as well. Yeah, there's plenty to ponder, isn't there? There really is. It's going to be a fascinating few weeks. Um, I'm not sure anyone right now has the correct answer, but I think we all know that it, it's it's going to be huge. And it, it, if you ask, if you went and polled 100 people in the cop on a Saturday, I reckon you'd probably come up with 20 different names of who they'd want. I think Clint's a great shout. I'm sure someone like him will put it. I mean, I know for a fact he's tried to get back to the club at times over the last few years. Um, I know that I'm sure someone like Steve McNulty would throw his name into the hat. He's obviously beginning his coaching uh, education, if you like, at, um, at Bootle. I mean, this goes to all three of you because people will have different opinions on this. Does the person who comes in need to have connections? Is that a hindrance to if they've got connections to Tranmere or is it a, a bonus if they've got connections to Tranmere? Uh. I think it's it's a bonus if it's the right person. It's just got to be the right person, whether you've got connections or not. And I don't think any fan will be bothered if they've got a connection or not, if we're doing well or playing the right way, the way we all want to play. I think, obviously, it's great to have ex-players who have got the heart and the passion and they love Trammy and it's amazing. And some of the names that are being thrown around, fantastic, amazing, if they are right for what we want to do. And that, that's the biggest question for me. Um, I don't think it, you need to be an ex-player or have an ex-connections with the club. I don't think it's a it's a necessity. Um, it, is it nice? Yeah, of course it's nice because you've got an idea of how the current club runs, how the fans want it, want it to be done. But it's definitely not a necessity. It's just got to be the right person. Yeah, I think um, for me, the only thing that having the, the former connection, it's kind of shortcuts your relationship with the fans, right? Because you, you, you hit the ground knowing the club, knowing the fan base, having that kind of inbuilt relationship already there. But uh, there's no reason why someone with no connections to Tramia can't come in and and develop that very quickly if we start doing the right things on the pitch and, and the way we play is, is, as Alex said before, matching how the club is being sold to the fans of where we want to go. Um, the, the only time I can see it possibly being a hindrance with a connection is if you've got someone coming in who maybe played for us at a time when things were, you know, much rosier about, you know, much more money and investment and suddenly they're coming into a club where it's not quite what they remember. And, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's a harder, it's a harder thing for that, for that person to come in, into the changing room and kind of understand quite where we are now. But, um, you know, there are, I, I hadn't thought of Clint, but, you know, that sort of, that sort of um, person could be a, a, a good one to go for someone who realistically probably would want to get onto the managerial ladder and, and, and come to us, but someone who, you know, it, it's not as big a risk because they've, they've been, you know, in an assistant role at a side higher up the pyramid already. So it feels like a natural next step. Um, I, I, I still feel sad that the Mike Jackson move didn't work out because it, it, I, I, it's a high, we'll never know. But I think coming in during COVID without the fans, you know, it was a real was a real shame for Mike. But I, I think that won't have helped some players, you know, just couldn't couldn't you know, play in the same way without a fan, you know, without a crowd there. Some players without the pressure of the fans probably were, were better than they otherwise would have been. But it's such a surreal environment to try and start start making making your way in, in, in the game. And without having the backing of fans at Prenton Park, it's a hard, you know, it's hard to keep that. Um, we saw how many away wins were happening in that season because, you know, the, the fans just weren't at grounds to make the difference. So um, I always like to see someone that we've, we've loved in the past come back and you have that kind of connection with them. But... Um, at the moment, I'd be, I'd be, 
you know that that's a nice extra tick in the box that isn't the key tick in the box for me you you're looking for someone who really impresses and into like i say i want to see the people who want to come and work here really setting out what they want to do how they fit in with that direction uh you know uh, 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 their own analysis of the players we have who they think can fit their view and and sell that to palace but that is only going to happen if we're offering the right thing to them as well because you know we are a, a a great club and a great project but not if we haven't got the budget to make us competitive and a manager is not going to want to come here and, and struggle with a, a budget they don't think is, is going to deliver what the club aims to do and potentially harm their careers in that way as well so yeah we'll have to just wait and see what uh, what the offer is from us and, and who's interested I suppose but yeah I don't mind either way. There's no doubt that our two most successful managers of course both came back to the club having had uh, successful spells previously mm-hmm. either as a player or as a manager so I think it helps and I think it certainly helps to buy them time with the fan base uh, you look at what happened to Keith Hill I mean there were no fans inside the stadium but it was fairly toxic on social media and I'm sure that having a former Bolton manager uh, in charge didn't help and didn't buy him any time at all even at times even though the, the football probably wasn't as bad as as many people would remember and possibly better than what we've seen this season but you know he, he chose to um, almost finish his own managerial job in the end with that that interview he gave after the Colchester game but I, I just think that we just have to get someone who's going to fit in with the system and I think the most important person in this recruitment process now is not a director of football. It's Mark Palios because he is the person who drives the vision for the club in the long term. I think he's possibly at the stage now where he's looking to leave some sort of legacy for, for when he eventually departs in whatever shape or form that is. And I think that I think he knows what he wants. I think he's passionate for the club. He is not an absentee owner. I think he's been a brilliant owner for this football club and you look elsewhere around League Two and we're very lucky to have the Palios family in charge but he needs to get this one right and I think that he needs to find someone who's going to fit in and I don't think we can cut corners I don't think we can we can necessarily go for the cheapest option we will have to go for an option that fits within the budget but I think that he's got he's got to give a manager a chance I think if if you if you go in and say, look, there's no money, here's some young players, just do it. It's not going to work. There's got to be some incentive to get it right, whether that's the structure or whether that's the quality of players in the squad. But I think Mark Pagliar ultimately is the most important person in this process now. So it's a big no to Sam Allardyce from uh, from Nige. We can uh, we can say that for sure. Uh, we don't want someone with Bolton connections. Well, I, I, I would have Steve Evans if he was going to get us top of the league. To be brutally honest, <laughs> looking where we are now, I know that he would probably rub people up the wrong way. But do you think Steve and his fans would pick Steve Evans to be the manager? But they're all loving him now, aren't they? They certainly are, and he's doing a fantastic job. Matt Dodd says Clint is a great shout. Uh, I, th- I think I agree with that, Nigel. I think he'd be a, a fascinating uh, arrival if he was to be involved in some way. Uh, Rich Davis says connection to TRFC, not a must, but no connections to rivals, please. No LFC or EFC legend. So I'm guessing Rich doesn't want, want John, John Barnes. Barnes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we will see what happens. But what I think we can all agree on is that it is sad that the Mickey era has come to an end like this because, look, for me, I'm 33. I started following Tramir. Sorry, I'm 32. I'm getting ahead of myself. I started following Tramir in 1995. I only saw bad days apart from a few brief matches under John Aldridge until Mickey took charge. And Mickey gave me two promotions, two Wembley wins. You know, we have to go back to the 1991 for the, the last time Tramir got promoted other than with Mickey Mellon. I think one thing that needs to happen is... We, when the dust settles, we need to remember just what happened in his first spell in charge and, and the fact that he actually brought Tranmere back from, as Mark Palios described it, the nadir of being in, in non-league football. And he he deserves a lot of respect for that, uh, for what he achieved. Not all round. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, we've got a statue of, of John Key outside the ground. What Mickey Mellon has achieved in the long term, I think, deserves something similar because to bring us out of non-league and take us into League One was an incredible achievement and and he really put Tramia back on the map. We also look at the games we had against Spurs and United in the FA Cup. I know we got hammered, but we had some great days, you know, that come back against Watford. Yeah, exactly. I mean, what a brilliant time, providing you didn't go to the pub at half-time. You know, that that was one of the great days supporting Tramia. So, he deserves a huge amount of credit. He is up there 
as a Tramia legend with John King, Ray Mathias, Ian Muir and, and the rest. And, and what's happened this season shouldn't tarnish that. I just think it was never it was never set up to work this season. And that's not necessarily all of Mickey Mellon's fault. Yeah, no, same. I, I think um I think we will all always look back on Mickey's time for me. I think this particularly this season we've 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 all felt since the summer uncomfortable with that that kind of clash between what we all know Mickey would want and and what maybe was being driven by the ownership in terms of direction. And I just don't think it's I don't think there's a way to match those two things up. So um I I'd love to see us us recognise him in some way going forward in the future. Um and yeah, some of those memories will 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 live forever, really. And um, yeah, I did. I didn't go to the pub at half time in Watford. I certainly went to the pub at full time. <laughs> 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 it was it was a great day, and we we had plenty of those under Mick. So um, yeah, no, um, not, nothing but uh, not, nothing but fond memories there. I think I'm just glad it's it's happened at a time where we can hopefully, you know, you, you we've got the time now to to try and get it, things right. But it it, it is a huge appointment. Um, um, and I, yeah, I hope Mickey um, takes a bit of time, takes a bit of stock, and um, and finds a good project that suits him going forward because he, he deserves it. A last word from yourself, Alex. Um, I just think I, I think it's happened in the best way. To be honest with Mickey, I think I'm just reading everyone's comments and and looking at everyone's attitude towards him. It, it's nice that it's come to an end in the way it has in terms of the, there's no sort of harshness on him and there's no sort of bad feeling I think everyone's proud of what he did um, and to go on that journey with him as a manager me as a fan getting to Wembley three times obviously we lost lost once but the other two times were, were amazing days and um, for me to have played alongside him and, and still have conversations with him when he was the manager was was unbelievable so take take the sort of joy out of everything he's done um, and move forward now it, it, it's finished it's done um, but with all the fans, that's not changing no matter what happens. Um, but now's the time for us to, to sort of move on in a positive direction. The big crossroads, what we do next, is massive. A big few weeks ahead, a big few months ahead. We will see uh, what happens and who replaces Mickey Mellon. Um, thanks to all three of you for joining us for nearly an hour, giving up uh, plenty of your Sunday evening uh, to come and join us. Thank you to all of you who've commented and who've uh, joined in the uh, well, the broadcast as well. If you have enjoyed it, please do subscribe. If you're not a subscriber to the podcast, three shows a week, player interviews, match reaction and all that as well. It'd be great to have as many of you on board as you can. It's £3 a month. Just go to a trip to the moon at pod.co.uk for more information on that. But uh, that's all uh, for this one. Thanks to everyone for joining. And thanks to all of us, uh, you as well, who've uh, contributed. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks, guys.